Tucker Carlson has called Jon Stewart a tool of the establishment, where Jon Stewart thinks that Tucker is just, well, a tool. But in this phony polarization and culture war, are we missing the real message here that both these anti-establishment figures have more to teach us than anyone from the homogenized uni-party authoritarian center? <laughs> Hello there, you Awakening Winders. Thanks for joining us on our voyage to truth and freedom. Remember, you can support our movement by clicking the link in the description. We regularly talk to important figures, journalists, politicians, who help us to become educated beyond the remit of our custodians and jailers in the mail stream. Surely this is an important moment where a figure like Tucker Carlson, despised and loathed on the left, but adored by many, and Tucker Carlson, let me say it outright out front, I consider him to be my friend. And the reason I like Tucker Carlson is because I see him as like an old school conservative, maybe, who is willing to just come out and say, I'm a free speech absolutist. I'm absolutely against war. He's come on our shows. He's been clear and open. And I would expect to disagree with anybody on a variety of political subjects. But with Tucker Carlson, I think he has good values and good principles. That is not what Jon Stewart thinks, though. He thinks that Tucker Carlson ought to be a pariah. I've heard him say that Tucker Carlson is deliberately evil. And on his return to The Daily Show, he's made Tucker Carlson one of his targets. And that makes sense when you understand understand the old rubric of left versus right, but I think politics has changed since Jon Stewart was last on television. Let's be clear here, Jon Stewart is an excellent comedian. Excellent. He understands comedy. He understands delivery. He understands character. He's an exceptionally gifted comic and I think a vital, incredible voice in our cultural space. That's why I think it's fascinating to see the two of them at loggerheads. But are we going to miss a real opportunity here when Tucker Carlson is a figure of the right, let's say for simplicity's sake, who is virulently anti-establishment. John Stewart is a figure of the left who is very pro-ordinary working people, who is critical of the establishment and yet is confined to certain areas of topicality. And we'll point them out as we go. But is there more to learn from both of these figures, their popularity and their ability, than we could ever learn from the centralized, homogenized, authoritarian, centralist figures that dominate our cultural space these days, i.e. Jon Stewart is whip funny, fast, amusing and right on. Tucker Carlson understands how to reach a wide audience with ethics and morals that clearly resonate with vast, almost incomparable numbers of people. And does it show us in a way that politics and media have changed since Jon Stewart was last on TV? And if we were to find an energy and a charge between these two poles rather than repulsion, in that magnetic power, we might find the source for new political movements that could be a genuine in challenge to the American war machine and global corporatism. Let's get into it. Just out of curiosity, uh, as a student. Firstly, how Jon Stewart did this was well funny. He sets up the bit that he's like learning from Tucker Carlson as a journalist and I lie about what you do. He did this in a very, very amusing and brilliant way. As someone who does this kind of thing for a living, when I see Jon Stewart do I think, wow, that guy, he's really good at this. They turn these ideas around fast. They find the comedy in the ideas. But what I'm interested in is why Jon Stewart never points out out that Tucker Carlson is consistently anti-war. Watching Jon Stewart deconstruct and attack Tucker Carlson on the basis of his interview with Putin is interesting, but I also would argue this was a really important interview and that in attacking Tucker Carlson, even though he does it brilliantly and amusingly, he is, to a degree, doing the job of the establishment because if the Democrat Party could press a button and prevent that interview from happening, they would have pressed that button because I think millions of people who never would have had access to it before saw Vladimir Putin clearly conveying a very particular perspective which could be called easily propaganda but certainly including like we are interested in a diplomatic solution we always made it clear that if Ukraine joined NATO it'd be a problem and not only that these are things that we were all aware of and discussing prior to the interview the 2014 coup in Ukraine and the way that's played out and subsequently even newspapers like the New York Times have published that the CIA have bases inside Ukraine and have been agitating and provoking a war so you can't call it an unprovoked war anymore so what I'm saying is I wonder is it possible that you could feel, as John Stewart does, a kind of antipathy and even disdain for Tucker Carlson and yet acknowledge Tucker Carlson's right and therefore his audience's right to share the views that they clearly do and to oppose the opinions of John Stewart, but find common ground when it comes to a general agreement that you can't trust the American military industrial complex, a subject upon which Tucker Carlson is very strong and to which this interview is integrally related? Because isn't the big establishment fear here that we'll hear Vladimir Putin 
Putin say stuff that makes us not want to fund an ongoing Ukraine-Russia war? And haven't you already heard a bunch of stuff that makes you think that diplomacy might be better than continuing to allow Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, etc., all to profit from that ongoing war? When you're sitting there interviewing Putin and you don't plan to challenge his utter bullshit, but you don't want to really be that obvious, what do you do with your face? <laughs> oh, I see. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so it's not really a straight face uh, as much as you try to convey a mixture of what appears to be shame, arousal, and I'm going to say irregularity. For instance, uh, like you're constipated while jerking off to a Sears catalog. This, I suppose, shows you the power of comedy because that's an entirely constructed idea designed to ridicule and it's a successful one and it's the kind of thing that comedians should be able to do and clearly do rather well. And it's one of the things that's slowly getting extricated from our culture, the ability to be cruel in good faith. Although this is, of course, not a well-intended bit. This is a polarizing bit. I maintain John Stewart is an anti-establishment figure when it comes to being critical of corruption. Did you see his interview with that pen? again official when it came to the subject of failing audits. An $850 billion budget to an organization that can't pass an audit and tell you where that money went. We can't make this content without the support of our fantastic partners. I'm particularly proud of these partners, Charlize. What a magnificent organization they are of radicals who care about looking after your skin without toxins. Have a look, stay for it. Look at this glorious apple. Why it's like the fruit of Eden. Indeed, it is the fruit of Eden. You can see why Snow White would be tempted by this glorious piece of fruit. On the other hand, the lowly banana decaying slowly, rotting before our eyes. The reason for that is apple stem cells, a technology that was utilized by Swiss scientists in a glorious experiment that showed that apple stem cells are effective in improving human beauty. Now, our sponsor today, Charlize, uses a toner that deploys apple stem cells to rejuvenate your skin. Ah. Oh. In much the same, I mean, that's just actually glorious. I feel better already. Not only does it make your skin feel better, it's boosting me with serotonin. If I was a little less responsible, I'd be drinking this because you could drink it. You shouldn't drink it, but you could drink it because it's completely toxic free. It fights the signs of aging using these apple stem cells. Mm, just one spray, it blasts your whole face, you'll look and feel magnificent. Me and my wife are using this together, our marriage is improving. Yes, our skin's looking great, I hope you'll agree. And the serotonin is sending us through the roof. Many of Charlize's products smell beautiful, they're all natural, they're completely toxic free. The orange citrus essence perfume is fantastic. There's a link in the description that will allow you to get 25% off by going to charlize.beauty and using the promo code brand. It's a simple choice really. This glorious apple or this droopy old soppy banana. That's charlize.beauty promo code brand. Me and the family are using it and we've nary felt better. Let's get back to the story. I think most people would consider that somewhere in the realm of waste, fraud, or abuse, because they would wonder why that money isn't well accounted for. What I'm trying to drive us towards here is the possibility of a kind of acceptance that there's a space that's neither Democrat or Republican in the former sense, but is a more decentralized, autonomous, truly democratic, anti-establishment position. Could it ever emerge? Here we go. So I guess you put in 10 rubles here and you get it back when you put the cart back. Now, possibly with his well-intentioned and enthusiastic appraisal of Russian supermarkets, Tucker may not have done himself any favors. So it's free, but there's an incentive to return it and not just bring it to your homeless encampment. I didn't realize America's homeless problem is caused entirely by easy access to grocery cart. <laughs> my stuff in my house, uh, but I didn't know I could just put it on wheels. It's so much easier. But it's odd, actually, because what is causing America's homeless crisis? Lack of infrastructure, lack of support. And where are those resources currently going? Evidently, to the Pentagon, to the ongoing war between Ukraine and Russia, the Middle Eastern wars that are escalating. So I suppose what I'm inviting is a spirit of conviviality, mutual acceptance, trust, and even love. Even though I adore comedy, I adore ridicule, I adore the ability to poke fun and even attack in good spirits. And both of these men are, in the case of Tucker Carlson, 
cousin, a person I consider a friend, in the case of John Stewart, a person I admire, but in terms of how is this playing out in the media? How is this playing out in the culture? And isn't it possible that what we're missing here in this polarity is the opportunity to identify, acknowledge and move into new cultural spaces rather than let this just sink into the morass of the culture war as just tit for tat spat that don't really go anywhere. Perhaps if your handlers had allowed, you would have seen there is a hidden fee to your cheap groceries and orderly streets. Ask Alexei Navalny or any of his supporters. In Vladimir Putin's Russia, political repression is everywhere. And hundreds have been arrested for daring to honor Navalny so publicly. Right. This is a point where you have to question the legitimacy and editorialization that's happening literally in that moment. It would be a perfect opportunity, one might say, for Julian Assange's name to come to the forefront of this show's mind. Julian Assange, who's in prison, awaiting potential extradition to the United States for journalism. And now we, of course, are beginning to understand that it's likely that Navalny died of... A blood clot. Because the difference between our urinal caked chaotic subways and your candelabra beautiful subways is the literal price of freedom. But also the literal price of freedom is America's ongoing imperialist projects around the world. The escalating tensions in the Middle East. The, some people are calling it a genocide in Gaza. The increasing tensions in the South Pacific between China and the agitation of Russia that's been continually framed by the media that I'd love to see John Stewart hold to account in the same way, continually advocate for as an unprovoked attack that needed addressing when increasingly we now know from New York Times reporting that the CIA had bases in Ukraine over 10 years and we're agitating for that war. And we know that NATO also understood that if Ukraine were ever to be granted membership of that organization, it would lead to an escalation of tensions between Ukraine and Putin. So when it comes to imperialism, colonialism, and the management of information, the establishment, the neoliberal left establishment, because in my view, there is no left anymore, have a lot of questions to answer as well. And I think that as long as you have Tucker Carlson, who I believe is much more critical of both parties than John Stewart, who still appears to be somewhat tribally affiliated with a Democrat organization in spite of being willing to criticize Biden. And there was a hell of a lot of blowback when he did, even on something as risible as his age. If John Stewart were to apply his comedic wit and incredible abilities to addressing the hypocrisy within the Democratic Party, I think it would relieve a great deal of tension. I know I felt excited just by seeing John Stewart attack Joe Biden and attacking Donald Trump. I felt like, yeah, this is what I want to hear. This is what I need to hear. Now, my satisfaction scarcely needs to be prioritized. But I think that what is being revealed by these two cultural orators, two polemicists, two polarized figures, is that the uni party space is becoming increasingly less relevant and movements and individuals from the periphery have a lot more in common with one another ultimately, even if there is a variety of cultural issues that may separate us. And I figure that if you were to acknowledge that on the subject of war, the military industrial complex, deep state involvement, the establishment of a censorship industrial complex, all of which has been underwritten by both the Obama administration and the Biden administration, all of which Tucker has reported on extensively, if we were to see those issues discussed in these spaces, we would start to recognize, hang on a minute, there is an affinity here. But you don't tend to see those issues discussed. Why? Because it seems to me that the establishment's primary weapon now in maintaining control of political institutions is to continue to portray Trump as a terrifying tyrant and dictator in waiting hysterically rather than ever addressing the failures of their own organization and their own party particularly when it comes to economic inequality. John Stewart is a figure of the left that I continue to admire precisely because he does reach out to what you might call ordinary Americans, his work with the first responders after 9-11, and his affinity with ordinary American people is one of the things, I know, let me know how you feel in the chat, that makes me still feel affection for John Stewart and makes me still feel hope that out of this incendiary space and this type of cultural conflict, new alliances may yet emerge. But the goal that Carlson and his ilk are pushing is that there's really no difference between our systems. In fact, theirs might be a little bit better. The question is, why? Why is Tucker doing this? Here's why. It's because the old civilizational battle was communism versus capitalism. That's what drove the world since World War II. Russia was the enemy then. But now they think the battle is woke versus unwoke. 
I think the emergence of woke owes a lot more to the fact that the Democrats now operate on behalf of metropolitan elites and have abandoned ordinary working people and therefore have to emphasise the cultural areas where they are more inverted commas progressive in order to distract us from the fact that now truckers are pro-Trump. To regard Trump as the source of the problem rather than a response to the failings of the American left is I think a similarly myopic perspective and also conveying a kind of go and love it, live in Russia if you love it so much. That's exactly the sort of thing that you would have heard from Bill O'Reilly just 10 years ago. And again, John Stewart in his spats with Bill O'Reilly, there was a kind of conviviality and a sense of hope that somehow there was a shared vision of America that might lead to mutuality, respect and trust. That kind of conversation seems to be disappearing from the public discourse. And in that fight, Putin is an ally to the right. He's their friend. Unfortunately, he is also a brutal and ruthless dictator. So now they have to make Americans a little more comfortable with that. I mean, liberty is nice, but have you seen Russia's shopping carts? I suppose at this point, you'd have to estimate for yourself how much of the United States military industrial complex and your tax dollar resources are being expended in the Ukraine-Russia conflict because of a humanitarian crisis and how much of it has being expended because as Julian Assange said, the goal is to create long, unending wars rather than successful ones. You mentioned Jon Stewart. The two of you have a bit of a history. I don't know if you've seen it, but he kind of grilled your supermarket and subway videos. But his other point was that I was somehow a partisan or a mindless partisan, which is definitely not true. Um, it is true of him. He is a mindless partisan, uh, but I am not. And I haven't been for, I really haven't been since I got back from Baghdad at the beginning of the Iraq war. And I realized that the Republican party, which I'd voted for, you know, my whole life to that point and had supported in general, um, was like pushing this really horrible thing that was going to hurt the United States, which in time it, it really did. I am a figure that came out of what you might call the cultural left. And I've got a lot of friends that feel much more affiliated with the politics and ideals of John Stewart than Tucker Carlson. One of the things they continually say about Tucker Carlson is his interest in things like displacement theory. I've never heard him talk about Tucker Carlson's continuing opposition to war from the Iraq war to contemporary wars, his willingness to interview people that are truly anti-establishment on a variety of subjects. And even a memorable piece where he spoke to Ben Shapiro, those were the days when them guys were communicating, on the subject of AI and whether or not he would pass laws to ensure that trucks could never be driven, for example, automatically because of the impact that would have on that particular sector of American working people, where he spoke in favour of government regulation of private corporations in a way that you would never hear anyone from inside the Biden administration talking in support of ordinary workers. Would you, Tucker Carlson, be in favour of restrictions on the ability of trucking companies to use this sort of technology specifically to, you know, sort of artificially maintain the number of jobs that are available in the trucking industry. Are you joking? In a no, second, I in a second. In other words, if I were president, when I say to DOT, the Department of Transportation, we're not letting driverless trucks on the road, period. Why? Really simple. Driving for a living is the single most common job for high school educated men in this country, in all 50 states. The problem, I suppose, is I generally find more affinity with people that say this system is broken, these institutions are not worthy of our trust, we need new political models, you can't trust the government, you can't trust corporations, than people that appear to be advocating for one side of a broken political system. For me, by continually being hysterical about Trump and Trump's impact, you're failing to acknowledge that the Democrats in your country or the labor movement in our party have failed ordinary people to the point where populism, nativism are inevitable reactions to the rise of globalism that makes many people feel there is a global agenda, there is a cartel of interests and institutions that are impervious to the democratic will of ordinary people. And for me, Tucker Carlson has been brilliant at attacking and addressing exactly those subjects. But I would just say this, John Stewart's a defender of power. Like John Stewart has never criticized like, what's John Stewart's view on, you know, the aid we've sent to Ukraine, the $100 billion or whatever? Like, what happened to that money? What happened to the weapons that it bought? He doesn't care. He has the exact same priorities as the people permanently in charge in Washington. If you're going to pretend to be the guy who's giving the finger to entrench power, you should do it once in a while. And he never has. There's not one time when he said something that would be deeply unpopular on Morning Joe. That's all I'm saying. And so don't call yourself a truth teller. You're you're a court comedian or a, a flatterer of power. Okay, that's fine. There's a role for that. But 
don't pretend to be something else. What I'm struck by when watching these two figures communicating presumably primarily to their own audiences rather than each other's is surely at this point there is a growing constituency that quite like John Stewart, quite like Tucker Carlson and hate the establishment, hate the uni party. That's what I think is being exposed by this era and by the great stars of this era is that the establishment and its institutions are failing. In fact, they're over. And what we're living through now is their frantic attempt to reassert control that used to be possible and plausible when you had centralized media. Welcome to NBC. Welcome to CNN. Now you don't have that. You have me. You have Tucker Carlson. You have Joe Rogan. You have all sorts of people. And back into that space, you have one of these, not old guard, I don't mean this in a dismissive way, a very, very brilliant comic who could succeed in any environment because of his skill adapting to what has changed since then. Because I feel, and I hope in a way, that there are more of us that think, not the Democrats, not the Republicans, something else, please, than are just like thirstily and happily backing up our chosen opponent in a culture war that does all of us a great disservice. Because guess what? While we're culture warring and clapping and applauding our preferred pugilist in this phony battle, the establishment is business as usual. And business as usual is ongoing war. And it's this subject beyond all others that led me to understand that what Tucker Carlson is doing is significant and important. The measure to me is, are you taking positions that are unpopular with the most powerful people in the world? And how often are you doing it? It's super simple, not for its own sake, but do you feel free enough to say, you know, to the consensus, I disagree. And if you don't, then you're just another toady. That's my view. Well, I think he probably feels free enough to do it, but you're saying he doesn't do it. On the big things, look, the big things, this is my estimation of it. Others may disagree. The big things are the economy and war, okay? Yeah. The big things government does can be, I mean, there are a lot of things government does. Government does everything at this point, but where we kill people and how and for what purpose and how we organize the economic engine that keeps the country afloat, those are the two big questions. And I hear almost no debate, uh, debate about either one of them in the media. And, I've, and I have dissenting views on both of them. I mean, I'm, I'm mad about the tax code, which I think is unfair. And, um, and the fact that we're creating chaos around the world, like is the saddest thing that's happening right now. And nobody feels free to say that. So that's not good. These are valuable questions to ask about the establishment media. Are they willing to interrogate war expenditure? Are they willing to interrogate and provide the reckoning that the pandemic period surely demands the errors that were made? It was in fact, let's not forget John Stewart, who was the first significant mainstream figure who said there's been an outbreak of chocolatey goodness in Pennsylvania with regard to the Wuhan Institute of Virology and the ridiculous coincidence of the emergence of coronavirus from that period. The disease is the same name as the lab. There's been an outbreak of chocolatey goodness near Hershey, Pennsylvania. What do you think happened? Like, oh, I don't know, maybe a steam shovel made it with a cocoa bean. Or it's the chocolate factory. So what I'm saying is our culture needs both of these figures. It represents the end of these systems. Is it possible that we have in the figures of Tucker Carlson and John Stewart, even while they're in the middle of a highly publicized spat, the kind of fusion that's required for solution? Thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Is this conversation and this polemic an indication that our old institutions are dying, new institutions are required, new conversations will have to take place in order for that to be achieved, and perhaps a conversation between between John Stewart and Tucker Carlson could certainly contribute to that solution. But that's just what I think. Why don't you let me know what you think in the comments and chat. Remember, if you want to support our little movement, click the link in the description. We have interviews with people like Tucker Carlson and God, I'd love to talk to John Stewart. One day we talk to journalists and leaders, always with the intention of coming together in unity and finding new solutions together. And more important than any of that, if you can, please stay free. Hey, thanks for watching. If you want to see more uncensored content where free speech can flourish, join our live stream. Click the link right here to watch the next video if you want to or become a member of a growing movement. Download the Rumble app and you'll be informed every time we make a new piece of content. Stay free.